Research Group. Uh, welcome to this policy research talk. Um, these talks provide us an opportunity to present work that's coming outside uh, from the research department with the goal of sharing the findings with colleagues inside and outside the department, as well as others outside the World Bank. Um, this time we've actually switched things up a little bit. We've teamed up with people um, from around the World Bank who worked on the World Development Report uh, 2021, uh, Data for Better Lives. And we'll be um, discussing research and data activities that flow from, from, from that report. Um, welcome to our viewers on WebEx as well as on YouTube. Um, so the way that we, we've structured the session today is we're gonna have three uh, presentations. Uh, one will be on data repurposing and synergies to improve development impact. Uh, one is on the quality of data and data systems. And then we'll talk about experiments and the statistical performance indicators that are outlined in the, in the WDR. And last, we'll talk about measuring the quality of the enabling environment, and in particular, the, the Global Data Regulation Survey uh, that sheds light on the data, light on that. Um, Following these presentations, we'll be hearing from a uh, discussant, Daniel Litterman, who is a lead economist and deputy chief economist in the Middle East and North Africa region of the World Bank. Uh, prior to this position, <clears throat> he held various positions in the institution, including in the Poverty Reduction and Economic Management Unit, the Latin America and Caribbean region, as well as the, the, the Development Research Group itself. After this, we'll open up for Q&A. So if you have a question that you'd like to uh, pose in person, uh, just raise your hand in, in the WebEx using the uh, raised hand option or signal to me in the chat that you have a question and I can call on you. If you have a sort of a clarification question, you can put it in the chat and we're hoping that the presenters, you know, when they're not presenting, might uh, have a shot at answering you. Um, just because we might not have a lot of time for Q&A, but that way we do have a chance of getting your question answered. If you're on YouTube, please uh, pose your question in the chat and that'll be relayed to me and I can, I can ask it on your behalf. So if, <clears throat> without further ado, <clears throat> excuse me, um, let's go for the first uh, session, which will last about 20 minutes, uh, on data repurposing and synergies to improve development impact. Um, this will be presented by two uh, presenters. Uh, first is uh, Rob, Bob Cull who was one of the World Development Report 2021 co-directors and is a research manager in the Development Research Group. Uh, he's gonna be joined by Talib Kilic, uh, who's a senior economist in the Development Data Group. So over to you, uh, Bob and Talib. Uh, thanks very much, Dion. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, it's a nice opportunity to speak to you about some of the details of World Development, 2020, World Development Report 2021 data for better lives. As Dion alluded to, this is a little bit different from typical policy re research talks, if you're familiar with them, in that we're trying to give a flavor of a lengthy, detailed report while highlighting research that exemplifies some of its main themes and describing new surveys and data that grew out of and were released in conjunction with the report. So, as Dion mentioned, we'll have more speakers than is customary and we'll bounce a bit from topic to topic, but we'll try to keep ourselves organized and on time. Um, so, next slide. Um, I should start by saying that we set out to write a report that focused not only on digital applications and the benefits of participation in the digital economy, but also on how data itself and improvements in its coverage, granularity, and timeliness and associated analytics truly holds promise for improving the lives of the poor. And in the first half of the report, we develop a collection of examples illustrating how improved data quality and reusing and repurposing data can and have led to improvements, improved development outcomes in terms of, for example, monitoring public health, disaster response, improved poverty mapping, which can lead to improvements in targeting and service delivery, road safety, monitoring depletion of natural resources, holding governments accountable through, for example, applications that allow citizens to report requests for bribes from officials, um, basic benchmarking of progress towards important policy priorities, such as financial inclusion. And our next speaker, Talib Kilic, will do a deeper dive on research, including his own, that combines data from satellite imagery with data from other sources to produce timely, more granular estimates of area under cultivation and agricultural yields. 
Um, the point of these examples is to illustrate that data really do hold great promise for improving the lives of the poor. Um, next slide. And it's no secret why this topic was chosen for the, oh, is there one before that? I don't know. Um, and it's no secret why this topic was chosen for the WDR. There's been an explosion of data produced and used by various actors. And the report is anchored by a conceptual framework that fo focuses on three particular groups. Um, the first is data received and generated by individual civil society and academia. Uh, the second uh, is data collected and analyzed by governments and international organizations on individuals and on firms. Uh, and the third is data that have become increasingly used in and produced as a byproduct of the production processes of firms. Next slide. Um, so the premise of the report is that data offer great potential and there's much more value that we could extract from them uh, from them, but um, this comes with some risks that we need to navigate. Um, for example, through this top pathway in our conceptual framework, data can foster transparency, enabling individual civil society and academia to hold governments accountable for policies and programs. Um, but it can also enable individuals and organized groups to cause harm through cybercrime that steals and manipulates sensitive information. Through the middle pathway, data produced, collected, and received by governments and international organizations can enable them to improve policies, design better programs, and perhaps improve service delivery. But at the same time, citizens' data can be abused for political ends, to rig elections, for politically motivated surveillance, or to discriminate against segments of the population. Through the bottom pathway, data are increasingly crucial to the production processes of firms. They foster improved decision-making and facilitate the matching of buyers and sellers, uh, which can create increases in productivity that generate growth. But firms can abuse consumers' data to engage in forms of anti-competitive price discrimination or manipulative and aggressive marketing techniques. More generally, because of increasing returns to scale, data-driven platform businesses have tended towards concentrated markets. In addition to the fact that a handful of firms are now in possession of a tremendous amount of information about individuals, this concentration can also make it difficult for entrepreneurs from lower-income countries to participate in digital markets. Because data and digital applications are a bit of a double-edged sword, the, double, the, the World Development Report calls for a new social contract around data, based on realizing greater value from it, but also inspiring trust that data won't be misused and that benefits from data are shared equitably. Uh, in the second two parts of the webinar, my co-directors, Dean Jolliffe and Vivian Foster, will return to some of these themes. Um, next slide. Um, because they are non-rival, data that were initially collected with one intention or purpose can be reused for a completely different one, and thus data repurposing and reuse are central to the report's conceptual framework. Um, for example, for data collected for commercial purposes could potentially be reused and repurposed to inform policy and improve development outcomes. The COVID-19 pandemic provides a timely illustration in which call detail records and geospatial data from cell phones um, have been used to track the spread of the disease and assess the effects of policies designed to mitigate it, such as stay-at-home orders. Our framework contemplates this type of sharing and reuse could occur between all the actors that we focus on, as reflected in the two-way arrows connecting them to each other in the center of the table. And again, Talib's presentation will describe efforts to combine different types of data to better monitor and forecast agricultural production. Uh, next slide. Um, to give a, a quick sense of the run of show and where the presentations will turn to next fit within the context of the report, here's a, a, a brief table of contents. Uh, as I noted, Talib's work is an example of creative reuses of data to create greater value, which is the topic of chapter four. Um, we'll then move on to co-director Dean Jelloff and the report manager Malar Verapon, who will present on data quality and experiments to improve it and on the quality of data systems as reflected in the statistical performance indicators that were released in conjunction with the report. Uh, those topics fit squarely with the themes in chapter two on data as a force for public good. Uh, we'll move from that uh, to a discussion um, by WDR co-director Vivian Foster on measuring the quality of the enabling environment for data and digital participation using information from the Global Data Regulation Survey, uh, which was also re released with the report. And this, these are topics that were covered in chapter six primarily. And finally, uh, Dan Letterman, BM's already introduced, has graciously agreed to comment on the report um, from the perspective of the MENA region. Um, with that, uh, I'll leave it there and I'll let Talib take it away. Okay, thanks. 
Bob very much and good to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Saeed Kulish. Today I'm going to talk uh, to you about our work on improving uh, crop area and yield measurement in uh, smallholder farming systems by integrating surveys and satellites. So agriculture is key to rural livelihoods and in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, it can contribute up to 85% of uh, rural household incomes. Uh, given the role of agriculture in uh, poverty reduction and food security, uh, doubling agricultural productivity and incomes of smallholders uh, is a key target within the sustainable development goal of ending hunger. And improving, uh, actually more broadly speaking, uh, even prior to the SDGs, improving the productivity of uh, smallholder farmers has been a long-standing goal in many uh, African countries. So to monitor the progress uh, towards international and, and national goals on agriculture, we need accurate measures of crop areas, uh, production and yields, not only at the national level, but with sufficient uh, within country uh, disaggregation. So these data can guide not only the targeting, but also the evaluation of policies and interventions, and not only in agriculture, but also in social protection, and disaster risk management as well. However, in many lower income countries that rely uh, predominantly on uh, smallholder farming uh, and that need these productivity improvements the most, uh, these data are often uh, either unavailable or unreliable. So what has been a game changer uh, in the last few years uh, that can help fill these data gaps uh, is the dramatic increase in the, uh, in the high resolution satellite imagery, uh, both the free imagery provided by the governments, uh, as well as the gated uh, imagery from the from the private sector, and we expect uh, continued growth uh, in the availability of high resolution imagery uh, in the coming years. So, uh, on the right is uh, the European Space Agency's uh, Sentinel-2 twin satellites, which are providing 10 meter resolution imagery for the entire uh, surface of the Earth every five days, uh, and they're making these imagery available for free. Uh, as a result, we are observing agricultural plots in smallholder farming systems with clarity that we could not have fathomed uh, just a few years ago. So our vision is a system that combines satellite data with georeferenced uh, ground truth uh, training data from uh, farmers' fields. Uh, these ground data can train machine learning models that can identify plots, classify crops, and, and estimate crop area and crop yields for entire landscapes uh, beyond locations in which uh, ground data are collected. Uh, these estimates would be at a higher frequency and greater resolution than uh, surveys alone, and would at the same time avoid biases that would otherwise exist by relying uh, exclusively on uh, satellites. Uh, today's talk uh, is focused on the role that uh, ground truth training data uh, play uh, in these integrated systems. So recent research has shown uh, the feasibility of satellite-based monitoring of agricultural outcomes uh, in smallholder farming systems. The published papers can be grouped uh, in term, into, into two bins uh, in terms of the source of their training data. Uh, the first strand uses uh, manually labeled satellite imagery, uh, mainly land cover types, and the second strand, second strand on the right uh, uses georeferenced uh, ground data either from existing or new uh, household and farm surveys that they commission uh, to train and validate uh, remote sensing models for uh, crop area mapping and yield estimation. And, and today's talk is related to this uh, second strand of uh, earth observation applications. So there are several important takeaways from existing research. First uh, is the fact that training data does affect the quality and the spatial resolution of satellite-based methods. Um, here are uh, various comparisons of uh, plot level maize yields in Uganda, where the average plot size is uh, roughly less than one fifth of uh, an hectare. Uh, on the ground, the objective crop yield measures are obtained through crop cutting, uh, that is physically harvesting and weighing uh, the produce from a, a subsection of a farmer's plot. Uh, in the panel A, uh, we compare full plot crop cuts on the ground to satellite yields that are calibrated to those harvests. Uh, while in panel B, we compare again the full plot crop cuts uh, on the ground, this time to uncalibrated satellite uh, yields, which are based, the, uh, based solely on satellite imagery and, and crop models and no ground data. So we see that both calibrated and uncalibrated yields capture the re yield variability on the ground uh, equally well. However, the uncalibrated uh, yield estimates are systematically overestimated. Uh, see the distribution shifted to the right in panel B. Uh, and again, this uh, emphasized the importance of using uh, in using ground data for calibration purposes. 
Uh, the second observation from the review of the literature is that much of the research has been conducted at the subnational levels, and there is significant variation in the in the type of and the approach to uh, training data collection as part of the surveys that the researchers use. Uh, and uh, and across the board, uh, there is this uh, desire expressed for recurrent large scale surveys uh, to address shortcomings in training data uh, for Earth observation applications. But an important constraint is that there are no clear recommendations currently on survey methods and the field work protocols uh, that can generate the right training data uh, as part of these large scale operations. And, and these uh, requirements are also expected to vary based on the outcome that we're trying to monitor, say uh, crop areas versus, uh, versus crop yields. So against that background, uh, as part of the 50 by 30 uh, initiative, uh, we're conducting research to develop guidelines for large scale data collection in low and lower middle income countries uh, in order to meet the training data needs for high resolution mapping of crop areas and crop yields. Uh, in the immediate term, the research is focused on Cambodia, uh, Ethiopia, Mali, Malawi and Uganda and on serial crop uh, area mapping and yield estimation. Uh, the, the guidelines uh, we're aiming to develop by, uh, by June of, of next year, and they will be important for, uh, for analysts uh, to assess the utility of existing survey data for downstream Earth observation applications, uh, as well as informing the design of future uh, household and farm surveys, uh, including those that will be supported by uh, the 50 by 30 initiative. Um, and our recent uh, research uh, tied to these uh, development of these guidelines uh, has sought to answer three operational questions uh, in the context of a satellite based maze area mapping uh, in Malawi uh, and Ethiopia. Uh, first, uh, we wanted to identify the minimum amount of training data we would need to reach an acceptable level of uh, accuracy for a crop classification algorithm that would be used uh, across an entire country. Uh, second, we investigated how uh, the approach to georeferencing plot locations on the ground would affect our accuracy. And then finally, uh, we document uh, how our accuracy is impacted by using different types of satellite data, optical versus radar, uh, and excluding plots uh, under specific area thresholds uh, in small uh, holder farming systems uh, due to concerns around uh, high resolution satellite imagery still not being able to pick up variation on and the very uh, small set of uh, plots. So uh, central to our data is obviously the training data that I've been mentioning that come from uh, various surveys. Uh, and, and to answer these questions, we combine these surveys with other geospatial data and, uh, and unique uh, machine learning framework. So let's start with the survey data that we use. Uh, the georeference survey data uh, come from uh, national representative multi-topic surveys that have been implemented by the respective national statistical agency uh, under the World Bank LSMS ISA initiative. Uh, in Malawi, we, the first survey we use is the Integrated Household Panel Survey, uh, which is a longitudinal survey that covers about 3,000 households and that attempted to collect uh, GPS-based boundaries of, of plots uh, cultivated by households that are engaged in agriculture uh, during the 2018-19 season. Uh, and in addition, the surveys also captured the GPS-based location of the uh, plot corner. Uh, at which the GPS-based area measurement uh, actually commenced on the ground. Uh, the second survey is, is a cross-sectional survey, also coming from Malawi, implemented at the same time as the, uh, as the IHPS. Uh, it's the IHS-5, uh, which covers around uh, 11,000 households, and that also attempted to uh, basically capture the same set of information vis-a-vis -vis the uh, vis a vis the IHPS. Uh, and finally, in Ethiopia, we rely on the um, Ethiopia socioeconomic a uh, household survey of 2018-19, um, which covers around 7,000 households uh, and, and only georeferenced the single corner point um, uh, of, for each plot that is cultivated by the households engaged in agriculture during the 2018 uh, main agricultural season. So the key variable uh, that derives uh, that, that drives the, uh, the sampling design of each survey is the household consumption, expenditure, and poverty. Uh, but these are large survey samples that uh, that yield uh, uh, a quite substantial number of agricultural households and extensive data on their agricultural activities of critical importance to our work is the georeference plot location uh, and the crops that are grown on, on each plot. Uh, maize is the primary uh, crop grown in Malawi, while in Ethiopia, small grains are more prevalent, uh, but maize still plays uh, an important role uh, as a staple crop. So 
Based on the survey data, we can simulate uh, different data collection scenarios uh, that vary the uh, approach to georeferencing plot locations uh, on the ground uh, that exclude uh, in the middle panel uh, small plots under specific area thresholds, and that also vary the amount of data we use to train our models uh, on, the, uh, on the far right. Uh, on geolocation specifically, we work with the plot boundaries uh, that are available to us and, and derive six simulated alternatives uh, with, with different implications for fieldwork implementation, uh, plus uh, the single corner point uh, as captured by the uh, by the. So uh, as a result, in Malawi, we tested, uh, we created and in turn tested uh, over 25,000 scenarios as a function of the, the geolocation methods. Uh, the, the 50 training uh, data subsets that we created, uh, ranging from uh, 2 to 100 percent of training data at an increment of two percentage points, uh, five area thresholds, uh, three different feature types, and, and five replications to capture the variability uh, in these estimates. Uh, in Ethiopia, where we have more limited scope of georeference survey data, uh, we tested a total of 250 scenarios, partly also informed by the findings from Malawi. Uh, in each survey, uh, we separate the uh, survey data into three bins. 70% is allocated for training, uh, training the model. Another 15% is, is allocated for, uh, for tuning that model called the validation sample. And the remaining 15% is used for uh, testing purposes. That is for comparing the uh, observed crop uh, cultivation pattern to the one that is predicted by the model um, uh, at that particular location. So uh, the, the plots are randomly segmented into these bins within each district. So the spatial distribution of plots in, in training, validation, and the test sets are, are comparable, uh, which is uh, what is being shown on this, uh, on this graph. Uh, and here's the uh, very uh, broad overview of the machine learning pipeline that we apply to each data scenario to identify the areas that are cultivated with maize, um, uh, where we combine training data from surveys with a series of vegetation indices from Sentinel-2 imagery, and other georeferenced, um, other geospatial data at the plot locations, including weather metrics, uh, slope, and elevation. Uh, and the model performance is then evaluated uh, by comparing the observed and the predicted outcomes within that 15% of the survey data uh, reserved for testing purposes. So um, here's some uh, quick uh, overview of our findings. Uh, with less than 1,000 plots, uh, multi-point approaches do, uh, do perform better. Uh, but uh, starting with at least 2,000 plots, aggregation approaches that rely on the uh, collection of plot boundaries uh, outperform uh, all available uh, approaches in terms of our accuracy metrics. Uh, we also document that we need about 7,000 points uh, with uh, 7,000 plots with a single corner point uh, to reach the performance uh, of uh, to reach the performance that. Uh, that we end up uh, with 3,000 plots under these more preferred uh, approaches, uh, which also had the fastest degree of learning. Uh, that is the steepest decline in the additional accuracy uh, gained by increasing the volume of our training data. Uh, and we also show that the peak performance can be achieved by roughly 60% of the training data under these uh, preferred approaches. Uh, and we find that centroid method uh, as the third best solution outperforms uh, the single uh, corner point method um, uh, across the board. So um, uh, I wanted to also give a very quick uh, overview about these, um, these differences and what they mean for a uh, total maize area uh, estimates uh, for an entire country. So we can appreciate that small differences in model performance, uh, which, is, uh, which is up to uh, 5 percent uh, percentage points of difference uh, shown in the middle column of this table can actually lead to very large differences in total maize area estimates uh, in, in Malawi, uh, again, with significant downstream implication for agriculture and food security policies. And the model performance is uh, highest while using survey data with full plot boundaries. Uh, and in the resulting estimates are also the most conservative in terms of area cultivated with maize. Uh, other methods tend to overclassify uh, and looking at measures of total area under disagreement vis-a-vis -vis the best performing model, we see again uh, the value of uh, achieving small performance gains, gains with, with better training data. And here we're doing a pixel by pixel comparison across the entire country at 10 meter resolution, tallying up all the pixels uh, with discordant values for the presence of maize cultivation 
vis-a-vis -vis the map we generate with the best performing model. And under less preferred approaches, uh, the extent of total disagreement could range anywhere from uh, 0.5 million to uh, up to 1 million uh, hectare. So uh, key takeaways, uh, we, we, we recommend surveys to complete flat boundaries, uh, to, to collect complete flat boundaries uh, to other uh, approaches on the ground. Uh, we document small erosion uh, in, in maize classification accuracy, in fact, results in large uh, overestimates of, uh, of maize area, uh, anywhere from 8 to 24 um, percent. And uh, we provide some recommendations around second and third best uh, strategies that could be adopted by large scale surveys. Uh, and one of the most important thing that we wanted to get at at the beginning of this research is how much training data that we need. And, and we don't need it all. And with about 60 percent, we can uh, we can do the jo job uh, just fine. So um, I had some uh, some concluding thoughts here in terms of where we are headed next, uh, where we're going to be moving into crop yield estimation uh, and the requirements for that and ultimately converging on these uh, on these guidelines uh, with cross country evidence from not only in Africa, but from uh, non African settings as well. So stay tuned for that over the next year. Uh, and also wanted to highlight these open access data sets of high resolution crop area maps that we made available publicly on Development Data Hub uh, for four agricultural seasons uh, for both countries. So thank you very much. You're on mute, Dion. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, thanks, uh, Bob and Talib. Um, just so everyone knows, we will have a, a, a web page that has uh, links to the uh, PowerPoint. So, you know, to follow up on those links that Talib showed at the end there, you will be able to access those um, when we put this all up online after the talk. Um, so next up, we have, um, we're going to have a, a, a section on the quality of data and data systems. Where we'll talk about experiments um, and in particular, the statistical performance indicators that are um, presented in the WDR. So this will be delivered by Dean Jolliffe, who is um, one of the World Development Report uh, 2021 co-directors and is a lead economist in the Development Data Group. And uh, he's going to be joined by Mala uh, Virapan, who was the uh, WDR 2021 manager and is a senior data scientist in the Development Data Group. So over to you, uh, Dean and Malar. Sure. Thanks so much, uh, Dion. <clears throat> um, so Talib has just demonstrated a, a series of fascinating examples where the joint use of multiple data offers this great potential to provide deeper insights. But as Bob noted in the introduction, creating greater access to data and in particular increasing the interoperability of data both helps produce greater value, but also creates opportunities for data to be misused to harmful effects. So how can we balance this need to use data more effectively for producing social and economic benefits? Um, with the need to ensure that it's not used to harm governments, firms, and people. So in the report, we argue that one large part of this answer lies in the realization of a new social contract for data. So uh, next slide, Miller. So untapping more value from data requires both that um, more people have access to data and that the data is shared more, reused more, repurposed to solve new problems. But why would people across the three pathways that Bob described do this? Can they trust that they have something to gain from sharing data? Can they trust that they and their data will be protected against harmful misuse of data? Without trust, they won't participate. So the broad nature of these questions points to the need to get all of society to engage in a dialogue around developing a social contract for data. And by this, we really just mean an agreement among all participants in the process of creating, sharing, using um, data that fosters trust in the data and that they will not be harmed by it. So trust that part of the value created by the data will be accrued equitably. Um, and it's really just about agreeing on the rights and rules governing that data use. Social contracts have existed for centuries. They reflect legal systems, they're reflected in legal systems across the world. But we need these contracts to adapt to this new world where data is deeply interwoven into our lives. Next slide, please. Well, the social contract provides the rules and compliance mechanism for how data can be safely shared, used, and reused by stakeholders. 
To realize data's potential, this framework has to be built around a data system that not only ensures safety, but also promotes access to data. So in the World Development Report, we offer an aspirational vision of an integrated national data system, or an INDS, which can serve to enhance the data flows across all of the different stakeholders. So that's what we're trying to demonstrate in here is a picture of many different stakeholders in this system, allowing all to benefit from the data use and facilitating the sort of innovative, creative new uses of data that Tollup is highlighting. Um, well, it's clear that for many of the countries that are the focus of our report, they're very far away from this aspiration. We nonetheless argue that it's important to provide a clear description of what countries should be aiming for as they take steps towards improving their use of data. So next slide, please. In this report, we devote a chapter describing what we mean by an integrated national data system. Uh, I'll show a couple of the elements uh, in the next couple of slides, but one central element is that it facilitates the flow across the different stakeholders, which we're listing on the side here. Um, and it's meant to convey that each of the participants in the system, public and private sectors, individuals, civil society, academia, that they're all producers and users of data. Um, so the figure is also meant to convey that in an integrated data system, the data have potential pathways to flow back and forth across all of the participants. Next slide, please. We discuss the attributes of data, the pillars of the data system uh, in the report. Um, I'll skip those here today. Um, but we also assert that this is uh, a sustainable version of an integrated national data system rests on foundational elements of creating data demand, funding, incentives, human capital, and trust. And it's this last element of trust that I want to spend a few slides focusing on now. Uh, next slide. In pinning the social contract on trust, the central idea is that people will trust that they will not be harmed. And the report devotes significant discussion to this point. But it also means that people trust in the validity of the data and they trust that the data is not being manipulated. So trust in the validity of the data means continually testing experimenting and reporting back on these results um, and that these activities really should be integrated into the regular development of data capture. So I want to provide a couple of examples of what we mean by uh, data experiments. So next slide. So this is an example where um, testing of the measure of plot size was integrated into farm household surveys that were carried out in Malawi, Uganda, Tanzania, and Niger. Um, for the majority of poor people in the world, using their land for farming is central to their well being, and how much land they cultivate and how productive that land is are key factors enabling people to improve their lives. But in many cases, these basic measures are frequently based on farmers' recall of both the plot size and the productivity of those plots. With the advent of new technology, it made uh, handheld GPS devices relatively affordable. And these new tools offered a new way to more effectively capture plot size and also can potentially show insights to the biases that might be resulting from uh, self reports uh, plot size. So in this case, the um, and across these countries, Many of the plots were measured with two measures, one the farmer self-report and one the measure coming from the GPS device. The key findings of this was that holders of small plots tended to over-report the size of their plots, making them look better off, and holders of large plots tended to underestimate the size of their plots, making them look less well off. On average, the difference didn't look so large, but the important thing here is that this, what typically looks like heaping on common sizes, which we see as one very common shape of measurement error, the experiment revealed that there really is systematic error underpinning this measurement error. And that systematic error has pretty significant implications for analytical work, uh, particularly in comparison to this common uh, assumption that um, self-reported measurement error might just be white noise. So in the case of white noise measurement error, obviously just leading to attenuation bias in analytical work, 
the systematic error would lead to very different types of biases mm -hmm. in the parameter estimates. And so in addition to sort of demonstrating the nature of this measurement error and the fact that it's quite large and has a very systematic pattern, an important part of this validation exercise was to demonstrate that handing out these cheap GPS mean uh, tools was a very cost effective way of gathering significantly more accurate data on plot size of farmers, a sort of central measure of their well being. Next slide. In a very closely related experiment, we mentioned that both the size of the land and how productive the land are really central to the well being of poor farmers. This is the result of an experiment carried out in Ethiopia where um, over 5,000 plots, there were two independent measures of yields gathered. One was based simply on the farmer self report of yield, which is really just this nature of how much asking the farmer how much um, of a particular crop did they produce from that plot size. And then uh, taking as a second measure, a crop cut measure, which is typically viewed as a gold standard measure of crop productivity or plot productivity. And the crop cut essentially just means taking a small subsection of that plot and having trained uh, agronomists harvest and measure the, um, the output from that particular crop. And again, the findings from this study showed that uh, if you looked at self reports, you got this very common finding in the literature, a finding that's existed for many, many decades, that yields are declining as plot size increases. Now that's a common finding, but one that's very challenging for um, uh, for economists in particular, well, for people to understand, because it certainly cuts against any sort of notion of increasing returns to scale and farm productivity and cuts against sort of many lessons learned in, in other countries. What we find from the crop cut data though, is when we look at yields that are coming from uh, measured and weighed um, um, plot productivity, it shows in the blue lines there. So I'm sorry, the red lines are the ones indicating the relationship between yields and plot size from self reports. The blue bars on the figure are the uh, lines indicating the relationship between yields and plot size from the crop cuts. And here we find essentially the opposite pattern where there's a slight increasing returns to um, size of plot land in terms of plot size in terms of yields. So this experiment similarly highlights that reporting error in this case is not white noise, but it's systematically correlated with relevant policy variables in ways which will really bias um, many uh, parameter interests, uh, parameters of interest in our analysis. And so the, the bigger point here is that we need to start building in as a just part of everyday work programs of uh, data collection activities, experiments to be continually assessing the potential for using new instruments and new ways of gathering data more effectively to improve the quality of that data. So at the beginning of these slides, I mentioned that people need to trust in the quality of the data, but I also noted that people need to trust that their data are not being, um, that they're not being manipulated uh, or that the ways in which the data are being used are being used in honest and transparent ways. And so one way uh, to think about, one tool to think about how to do this is to gather data on the performance of data systems. And so in particular, it's important to understand and measure and monitor the extent to which data are made available, are well documented, and that statistics produced from data are transparently developed and documented. So I'm gonna hand over now to Malar uh, to talk about these aspects of data, both making them accessible and monitoring um, the performance of the data systems in countries. Malar, let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Dean, um, and uh, hello to everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. I want to start off uh, by uh, saying that the WDR 2021 um, advocates for data and analysis to be shared and publicly made available for advancing the principles of reuse and repurposing that Bob and Talib talked about earlier. In the same spirit, we have made available all data all data sets and analysis uh, from the report in the World Bank's data catalog and uh, the WDR website. 
There are three data sets that are original contributions um, of the WDR, and two of them are being covered in today's presentation. I will focus on one of the data sets, which is the statistical performance indicators. Before I dive into the details, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the SPI team uh, comprised of Kumar Sharajadin, Brian Stacey, Ayan Dang, Jerrica Diaz, and uh, Mustafa Ding. Bob and Talib and Dean, um, all of them talked about the power of data reuse and repurposing and the critical need to improve data flows, uh, the data quality and use, especially in the public sector. The astonishing increase in the available uh, data today and uh, new ways in which people access and use data and the recent COVID-19 pandemic has only intensified these needs. This all means that um, it requires us to update our thinking about uh, the capacity requirements in building data systems uh, in countries. And again, Dean talked uh, uh, more about that uh, before. And this updated thinking requires us to adapt our measurement and benchmarking tools to look at the data systems and statistical capacity in a new way. SPI is part of these efforts to create a tool for countries and development partners to assess data and statistical systems and to help identify areas for improvement. This is an overhaul of the statistical capacity indicators, which has been in place since 2004. Uh, and informed by various dialogues in the international fora, the statistical performance and indicators aims to do the following. It offers a framework that is forward looking, that is relevant for this decade and stands the test of time. Unlike some of the other indices, it measures all uh, national data and statistical systems, including uh, both the less advanced ones and highly advanced systems. Uh, we also place a strong emphasis on transparency, and so the SPI is, is open data, open code, as we call it, where users can freely access data and see and replicate how every step was constructed. Uh, all of the code is available in the GitHub report repository, and uh, which, for which we will share the links at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, all this is to say that our aspiration is that uh, this will give countries incentives to build modern data and uh, statistical systems. The SPI is organized into five pillars, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and under each, uh, there are components or dimensions. Here, I'll briefly draw attention to three pillars that might be of interest to you. Um, so data has no uh, value unless they are used. So data use is the first pillar of the SPI. Um, and the components of this pillar are data used by branches of government, civil society, academia, and international uh, agencies. Uh, we, we all know how important it is to improve uh, data access and use, uh, especially to the research and the academic community. Uh, you know, for example, for, for doing more data experiments, as Dean was pointing out. Another example of this would be, um, does a country produce dead statistics or statistics on safely managed water that, uh, that are used by international organizations and academic institutions? The second pillar is data services that are trusted by users such as the quality of data releases, the openness of access. Uh, all of this links to the points that Dean raised, raised about data quality and trust in data systems. An example of how this is measured is using the open data openness score by Odin, which is based on whether data is, uh, are available online in a format that is machine readable, in a non-proprietary format, uh, downloadable with, uh, of course, metadata and appropriate terms of use. I'll uh, skip this one. Uh, and the next one is uh, accessing whether, uh, assessing whether a country conducts census or surveys on a regular basis is important and which, which is something we've uh, typically done, but also equally important is whether it has administrative data, geospatial data, uh, and data generated by private sector and by citizens. Uh, and this is, this is taken forefront, especially in, uh, during the pandemic times. And this is covered by the fourth pillar on data sources. To uh, measure these pillars and dimensions, we've uh, compiled a set of 51 indicators, which is based on publicly available data sources. We benefit from large scale data collection efforts by organizations and many of our partners are listed here. And the SPI indicators can be added up to form composite scores. We aggregate indicators to have a score by dimensions, uh, then by pillars, and then an overall score, which is the SPI index. The overall index gives a broad sense of where a country stands, but this can also be broken into components to see where a country leads and lags and where it may need to improve uh, because different countries have different strengths and weaknesses. This is to say that it's an additively decomposed index. The full details of the constructions of the SPI indicators and the index 
are available in the policy research working paper and a technical note, again, which both of which you can download from the SPI website. Now, I would uh, like to share some um, early analysis uh, based on the SPI that uh, raises important policy and research questions. First, I'll start with this uh, world map of countries, uh, which is plotted by the overall SPI scores. We have scores for 174 economies, and this covers over 99% of the world population. What we see in the map is uh, country by quintiles, uh, and the deep green uh, color being the top 20%, and the deep uh, orange being bottom 20%. Since there are dimensions where we don't have uh, uh, rely, still have, I mean, uh, reliable data uh, with broad coverage, uh, we compute uh, scores in quintiles uh, as opposed to individual countries to avoid hi highlighting differences that might not be uh, meaningful between countries. Here you can see high income and OECD countries tend to do the best, and uh, Sub-Saharan African countries tend to score relatively poor. This is uh, reinforced here when we look at the regional average scores. Uh, you can see that North America and Europe and Central Asia have pulled away from the rest. Uh, and you can again see that Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East and North African countries uh, are scoring lower. Uh, but what's uh, more um, important and interesting is, is when you look at, uh, when you look within each region, there are tremendous variations, which uh, raises several policy and research questions. Why are countries within similar regions having vastly different performances? What are the countries uh, which need most help? And this is uh, plotted using the overall score. But if you start examining scores by the five pillars, uh, which are the data use, the services, sources, and so on, you will re realize there's even more work to be done at the country level. And it sheds um, interesting um, spotlights on where the improvements are needed. In comparison to the SPI uh, score across regions, uh, there's a pretty strong difference uh, based on income classes when you, when you plot them based on the uh, World Bank's uh, income classifications. We do see here large in scores of the income, income countries um, do perform poorly and have a long way to go. But uh, the, that is not to say that income decides the statistical performance of a country. Uh, here, several countries um, overperform on the SPI for their levels of income compared to similar countries. As uh, one example, here's a list of some of the countries underperforming and overperforming relative uh, to their GDP. Uh, for example, uh, Mexico has a GDP per capita of around $10,000, and it is performing as well as a country with twice the level of its GDP per capita. So there are other factors, for, for example, human capital, uh, governance, and how you prioritize data that matter for performance. Another example uh, that I'd like to highlight is from the uh, WDR, again, 2021 report, which you might find interesting is where we use SPI in the discussion on the importance of legal, financial, and institutional independence of the NSO for improved data quality and openness. Uh, my colleagues Daniel and Philip have written a blog on this uh, if you want to read more on it. Studying the causal relationship between NSO independence and data quality is challenging, but as shown in this chart here, the SPI along with the Abraham Index of Africa Governance um, provided correlational evidence suggesting that an independent NSO improves the availability and quality of data. The Abraham, uh, a little bit of information on the Abraham Index, it's an indicator that captures the independence of NSOs in all African nations. The indicator measures the institutional autonomy and financial independence of an NSO. A perfect score indicates that an NSO is able to publish data without clearance from another government branch and has sufficient funding to do so. Uh, here in this chart, you can see a higher score of the NSO independence indicator is highly correlated with the statistical performance as captured by the SPI. On the other hand, uh, civil society function in demanding government a free and empowered press is critical check uh, on government uh, power in general on government interference uh, with stat statistical independence and data transparency in particular. We uh, also see here that uh, in this chart, uh, greater press freedom uh, as measured in the World Press uh, Freedom Index compiled by uh, Reporters Without Borders is um, highly correlated with the statistical performance, as well as the statistical independence, regardless of a country's size or income level. Uh, these two examples show how uh, civil society, I mean, uh, particularly press freedom and a relatively independent NSO are mutually uh, reinforcing. 
In summary, SPI provides an evidentiary basis for several such uh, discussions and debates related to data foundations that are necessary for achieving a well-functioning and trusted data system in countries. Um, I would like to end by saying that this is the first edition of the SPI, uh, and we aim to increase the availability and coverage of indicators as we continue to make improvements. Uh, the main goal is to provide a measurement framework that is more in line with the demands of the new global data landscape. We hope the tool helps countries examine weaknesses and improvements needed in their data and statistical systems, allows benchmarking against other countries so they can learn from good practices and provide donors and others with information needed to allocate funds in improving more holistic and trusted data systems. Uh, here are several links to further resources. Uh, don't forget to also check out our interactive dashboard where you can actually explore, construct, deconstruct the SPI. Uh, I'll also finally end with a link to the WDR report. Thank you very much. Now I uh, will hand it back to uh, Dion. Thank you. Thanks, Dean Miller. Um, I, I, maybe you've noticed in the chat, uh, Ryan has put a link to where all the materials from today's presentation will be posted after, after the session. So last, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to turn to Vivian Foster, who's the third uh, co-director of WDR 2021, and she's the uh, chief economist for, for infrastructure here at the World Bank. She's going to talk to us about, um, particularly about the, the Global Data Regulation Survey and, and insights that we gleaned from that, but, but more generally about the enabling environment for data. So over to you, Vivian. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dale, it's a pleasure to join this seminar. Um, I will try and pick up the story a little bit where my co-directors left off. So we heard a lot from um, Dean in particular about the idea of a social contract as being at the heart of the World Development Report 2021. And that's a very useful sort of abstract framing concept. Um, but of course, uh, to achieve a social contract, you need a lot of nitty gritty work on data governance. And that is why the whole second half of the WDR really unpacks the data governance challenges uh, that are currently faced. Uh, we think about the data governance in four different areas. Uh, we look at infrastructure policies, laws and regulations around the use of data, economic policy uh, imp implications, as well as institutions. And we just heard um, a very interesting presentation on how to measure the quality in particular of statistical institutions in a country. This final uh, segment of our seminar today will zero in on the uh, the blue pillar there, the laws and regulations surrounding data. And somewhat uh, in parallel to what uh, Malar has presented on statistical performance, we're going to discuss um, a way of capturing the performance of the legal and regulatory environment for data in a country. But let's maybe just start with an example, because I think that COVID-19 has really presented um, the clearest and most dramatic illustration of what this particular talk is about. Um, with uh, the widespread use of mobile phone records uh, in many countries to inform uh, contact tracing and public health efforts to curb the spread of the pandemic, we have a perfect illustration of, on the one hand, you know, the, the desirability of enabling the reuse of data collected by mobile phones for a completely unintended use of tracking public health uh, by government. Uh, so that's the enabling side of the equation, if you like. But at the same time, this very um, activity uh, generating tremendous concerns in the public around the misuse of data and the need to protect privacy uh, and the, uh, the private character of the, the data that's being used there by governments and prevent it to being used for something unintended. And this whole issue is now resurfacing under the guise of vaccine passports. So it's a, it's a similar set of issues. So what we're going to be uh, looking at in this presentation is a global data regulation survey that will enable us to measure how advanced a country is both on the safeguards, the data protection aspect, but also the enabling uh, of those data flows across different uses, as we saw also in the first presentation can be so valuable. So uh, the rationale for this global data regulation survey is indeed to provide a diagnostic tool that enables us to examine this regulatory environment uh, for data in a standardized way and pinpoint where particular countries may be falling short. The methodology uh, is a standard questionnaire um, sent to local legal firms specializing in ICT and data governance uh, uh, in 80 countries. And we uh, heard from multiple firms in each country. Um, 
Our, our core team then undertook detailed desk review of the legal texts to verify that the questionnaire responses were accurate. Um, and this was then also checked with our um, country digital economy specialists from the operational side. Um, and then this is fed into the World Development Report. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the role of Rong Chen, uh, who led this particular activity, uh, uh, but who unfortunately uh, is unable to be with us today. Uh, so here, just to give you a sense of the country coverage uh, for the Global Data Regulation Survey, uh, a good spread across regions as well as across income groups, as you can see down here. And I wanted to mention that the Digital Development uh, Group is already committed to both um, you know, expanding the country coverage over time, but also continuing uh, to update uh, this uh, area of uh, investigation. Uh, in order to uh, measure the quality of the regulatory environment, we had to create a conceptual framework. Uh, and in so doing, we drew heavily on the work of David Satola and Adele Barzilai, who were the legal counsels on the team behind the chapter six uh, piece on data regulation. Uh, and they found it helpful to think about data regulation in across, across three different dimensions. So the first dimension is personal and non-personal. So you need different laws and regulations to govern personal data, which is very sensitive to what you need for non-personal data. The second dimension is public and private. Again, you need different types of laws and regulations to govern what the government does with data versus to govern what the private sector does. And the final dimension is domestic and cross-border. Uh, showing that while a lot of data regulation is at the domestic level, uh, there are important complexities around you know, how you enable and, and safeguard the flow of data across international borders. And we'll be covering each of these three dimensions uh, in this presentation. So drawing on this, um, these ideas, uh, the data regulation diagnostic uh, is broken down into different modules. So the first high level breakdown is between the safeguards that are protecting the data and the enablers that are allowing it to flow smoothly around the system. Within safeguards, we look at safeguards for personal data and non-personal data, as indicated, as well as safeguards for cross-border data flows, and additionally, the whole area of cybersecurity and cybercrime. So under the enablers, we break it down into three modules, the foundational one being the e-commerce e-transactions module, uh, and then we distinguish between enablers for public intent data and enablers for private intent data. So when you add all that up, that gives you about seven different modules and underpinning each of these, there are multiple questions looking at different dimensions and we're going to unpack those as we go through. Just a brief word on methodology. Um, this is how we uh, score countries by looking at how their score you know, differs uh, from the minimum score in each area and, and normalizing that against the maximum uh, difference between uh, the maximum and minimum score. Um, we then uh, sort of average scores to create a, a pillar and sub pillar level scores, and we use a traffic light system to, as a sort of easy way of, of conveying the extent of performance all the way from red is a zero to 25 score all the way up to green, which is uh, between 76 and 100 is an advanced uh, development score. So to give you a, an idea of how countries come out overall, uh, we're plotting here the average safeguard score on the vertical axis against the average enabler score on the horizontal axis. You may notice that the correlation between them is in some ways rather low at 0.37, suggesting that countries don't necessarily you know, give a simultaneous or balanced a consideration to both of these aspects. Overall worldwide, we see a preponderance of uh, dots uh, under the 45 degree line, suggesting that typically the enabling environment is a little more developed than the safeguarding environment uh, in most countries. Um, but with the high income countries in blue generally having a little bit more of a balance. Uh, here we present the average scores by income group across the seven different modules uh, that we discussed. And as you will immediately notice, the most advanced areas across income groups are the e-commerce enablers as well as the cybersecurity safeguards. Um, nevertheless, um, we do see uh, you know, a, a systematic difference across income groups. Uh, but also um, the fact that even the high income group uh, has, you know, quite some quite major areas uh, where, of underdevelopment in the regulatory framework. Um, as you may also see, there are certain areas like private in enabling private intent data um, and enabling uh, cross-border data flows, as well as safeguarding non-personal data 
which systematically lag behind across all uh, income groups in terms of the sophistication of the data regulation environment. So now we're going to start to drill down. We're going to begin with the safeguards indicator, where overall, on average, we have about 40% of the regulatory environment in place. And this gives you a, a quick sort of um, you know, view in the map of the traffic light uh, system that, that we discussed. Uh, you can see some, some notable weaknesses, particularly in some of the large middle income countries when it comes to safeguarding um, data. So now we're going to go through the different modules uh, and now drill down underneath the seven modules. What are some of the specific areas uh, that are detailed in the Global Data Regulation Survey? So we start here with cybersecurity. Uh, and what you see immediately in cybersecurity is you know, there's quite a lot of regulations in place in countries. Uh, you see that the institutions that, uh, you know, that respond to cybersecurity incidents are in place in many countries. But there's very uh, little uh, progress in terms of the security requirements for automated processing of personal data or the requirements placed on data processors and co controllers. You see a, a major area of underdevelopment here across even in the high income group category there in blue, let alone the low income in purple. Uh, we turn now to the issue of personal data protection, uh, where we see a uh, very uneven uh, development. Um, so, for example, we see um, that, you know, there's quite a, a lot of uh, countries have made some progress on enacting data protection laws or creating data protection uh, authorities um, or placing uh, data minimization requirements, purpose limitation, data storage limitation. However, there are a number of areas where there's been almost no progress. Uh, so one of these, for example, is the regulatory limitation on algorithmic decision making. There's very few countries that are limiting the use of algorithms or controlling it from a regulatory standpoint. Similarly, relatively few countries have made progress on privacy by design, which is a sort of technical way of protecting privacy by building it in to the actual IT uh, you know, fabric of, of, of the data. Um, and very few countries uh, have exceptions to limitations on data collection and processing by governments. So you can see here how uneven the progress is. But perhaps uh, most dramatic of all uh, is the uh, regulations for cross-border data flow, which, as you can see here, are essentially conspicuous by their absence. Uh, so relatively few countries have anything in place across all income, uh, income groups. And we're going to come back to the cross-border issue a little later on. In terms of examples, we do want to emphasize that while the uh, developing countries are typically lagging behind, there are some notable exceptions. And we found that uh, Kenya was particularly advanced with its 2019 Data Protection Act, uh, which has a very good uh, you know, uh, example of cybersecurity measures, including uh, you know, pseudo anonymization and data encryption uh, and arrangements for restoring data access after a breach and managing risks. Uh, the data protection aspects were also quite good in this piece of legislation. So there are certainly good practices that developing countries can uh, look to uh, when filling in some of these regulatory gaps. We turn now to the picture on enablers, where we're a little bit further ahead, about 50% of good practices in place. Um, and uh, notice, for example, Brazil that was doing terribly on data protection, but is doing really quite well on enabling uh, data reuse. Um, so let's uh, look uh, again at the different aspects of this. So we start by looking at um, enabling public intent data. Um, and here we see that um, you know, there's been quite a lot of progress, for example, with access to information legislation, which gives the, uh, the public the right to request data from government, to some extent with open data laws um, and open licensing uh, regimes. However, uh, there are major uh, gaps in terms of interoperability uh, of data systems. Um, and there are plenty of exceptions to the access to information rights. So the law may give the right, but then the government has all kinds of loopholes to prevent people from actually exercising that right. Um, and we also have you know, shortfalls in terms of uh, data classification so that there's clear understanding of what is the level of access to different kinds of, of government data. So overall, you know, a certain amount of progress, but uh, many of the nitty gritty aspects uh, still leave a lot to be desired uh, when it comes to uh, open access to public intent data. Uh, if we look at access to private intent data, uh, it's really quite dramatic how little has happened in this space. Uh, apart from the issue of IDs, where there's been a little bit of progress, 
Uh, there's very little, um, you know, adoption of data portability rights for in individuals or of the actual formatting requirements that would make data portability meaningful, uh, and very little use of mandate date for voluntary licensing of access to essential data. So this is an area that's completely in its infancy. And we find this a real concern because when you think that most of the uh, data revolution, that the sheer expansion of data availability is coming from the private sector side, if there's no regulations in place to help to allow people to access and share that data, then all of that value of data is being locked up within corporations and is not being shared with society more broadly. That's why we think it's interesting to look at a few countries uh, or a few cases where this private intent data sharing is happening. In, in particular, we highlight uh, the EU, um, uh, where there are uh, there is a clear definition of what are high value public interest data sets that may be held by the private sector, um, and which uh, you know includes uh, some requirements to make these available in machine readable formats. The case of France's Digital Republic Act, which actually mandates access to these data sets, even if they're in private hands or the UK's act, which um, allows uh, universities to access them for research purposes, are, uh, I think, trailblazing examples of really trying to open up the space. Uh, we do also see smart cities as being a frontier area where certain uh, forward looking municipalities like Sao Paulo, for instance, in Brazil, are actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, striking deals with the private sector so that uh, municipal uh, data can be uh, private sector data of use for municipal planning and management can be made available to cities. But other than that, a lot of private sector sharing is under the um, auspices of data partnerships and under the banner of corporate social responsibility. The bank, of course, has its own data partnerships program, which is very helpful. But that all relies on the goodwill uh, of the private uh, private companies um, and doesn't give us, as it were, systematic ability to use this information. Uh, so now that we've talked about the global data regulation uh, survey, I'd like to finish uh, by providing you with an illustrative research application uh, that was done as part of the WDR 2021 background papers. Uh, this is a paper by uh, Martina Farrakhana and Eric Van de Merrill um, on uh, the impact of cross-border regulations for data movements on the extent of data-enabled services trade. Um, and I want to underscore with this picture here on the right hand side, the exponential growth uh, in data enabled uh, services trade, uh, which now um, is growing twice as far as conventional, fast as conventional trade in services, and now accounts for about half of all trade in services. So this is an incredibly important area of trade. Uh, and in case you're wondering whether this is relevant to developing countries, um, I think the example of Philippines is really interesting because their data enabled services trade already reaches $23 billion a year, um, which is half as much as their manufacturing trade and twice as much as their agricultural trade. So this really is mattering for, for developing countries. Uh, so what we do, uh, or what Martin and, and, and uh, Martina do, uh, Eric and Martina do in this paper, um, is to take the information from the Global Data Regulation Survey and use it to classify countries into three different models for the regulatory environment supporting cross-border data flows. So the first model that's there in blue uh, is called the open transfers model. It's exemplified by the United States. And in this model, the government essentially has does not interfere at all with cross-border movements of data. Uh, corporations are, are free to determine their own protocols and the government will only intervene if there are complaints that the company violated its own protocols. But that's the only uh, kind of ex post restriction, if you like. In addition, there's very little um, personal data protection at the domestic level in the United States. It's a relatively weak um, protection environment. So you can see that this uh, policy has also been picked up in Australia. Um, and we have a number of developing countries that have a similar regime. Um, our feeling is that these countries really have this regime by default because they haven't done anything uh, to regulate cross-border flows. And so by default, they have this open transfers uh, regime. The second regime we look into is the so-called conditional transfer, which is in yellow and is exemplified by the European Union's um, GDPR. Um, and in this case, we have a strong uh, domestic uh, data protection regime for personal data. Um, but if data is to move across borders, the government first has to certify that the recipient country has an adequate domestic data protection framework in place. If it's de deemed adequate, the data can then flow freely. But if it isn't deemed adequate, then it can't. 
Now, getting this adequacy determination is a time consuming regulatory process. And as of today, there's very few developing countries that have achieved an adequacy determination, Argentina and Uruguay being, being an example. But what we do see uh, here in yellow is that uh, quite a number of developing countries are essentially tracking the European approach to a cross border data regulation. Often this is motivated by a desire to trade with the EU. And then finally, in purple, we have what we call the limited transfer model. Uh, these are countries where um, there's often quite strong data localization requirements, meaning that all domestic data has to be stored locally, or at least a copy has to be stored locally. And the government has much more um, a hands on role in determining whether or not data can cross borders. Uh, this uh, regime is exemplified by China and Russia, but also being picked up by a number of important middle income countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Nigeria, uh, Kenya uh, and Ghana. Um, so the question is, the research question is, how does my regulatory regime affect my ability to participate in this burgeoning uh, cross border data enabled services market? Um, and before we go into the actual results of the model, I want to just show this visualization of the data. So this is the current um, you know, trading patterns of data, data enabled services around the world. Um, we have importers across here and exporters across here. Uh, the color represents the color of the, of the model. Um, in gray is uh, countries that trading across models. So you know, they have one model and their trading partner has a different model. Notice this enormous yellow circle showing that the bulk of uh, digital services trade globally is happening inside the European Union. And also note all the big circles here uh, showing that um, you know, much, uh, another big share of the trade is with between the European Union and other countries. Uh, notice almost no trade uh, between China and Russia here uh, in terms of the countries that have the most restrictive models in place. So uh, what we, what uh, Eric and Martina have done is to create, use a, a conventional gravity uh, model to explain the extent of trade between digital services, trade between countries, and to add in there um, regulatory variables drawn from the Global Data Regulation Survey. Uh, what they find is that the, the, the yes. Sorry, um, we are running a little out of time. Um, I want to make sure give uh, D Daniel a chance to intervene. So if you don't mind wrapping up in a couple of minutes, um, sorry to interrupt. Absolutely, but, no thanks. problem, Dan. I'm actually right, right now finalizing. Um, so just to show that the um, open transfers model uh, significantly adds, you know, leads to higher levels of trade, uh, whereas the limited transfers is a big dampener on the extent of, of digital services trade. The yellow model is complex because the um, conditional trend, the need for adequacy determinations is slowing trade back down, but the, the strong domestic data protection seems to actually have a positive impact on trade by creating trust and confidence in the system. So finally, what is the potential then for further research in this area? We see that the global data regulation diagnostic will be very valuable from an operational standpoint in helping us to pinpoint uh, deficiencies in regulatory frameworks and designing uh, policy reforms to address those. In terms of research applications, the primary relevance of this, uh, these indicators appears to be for cross-country panel econometrics, targeted at measuring the impact of the regulatory environment on economic outcome variables of interest. In addition to the issue of trade, which I've just illustrated, the data set may be useful for examining other aspects of the digital economy, including adoption of digital technologies and expansion of digital service activities more generally. Thank you, Dayon. Back to you. Thanks, Vivian, and sorry for interrupting there. Uh, I should have realized you are on your second to last slide anyway. So, but anyway, um, so yeah, the, this has been fascinating. You know, perhaps unsurprisingly, one of the big contributions of this report is, is data about data. <laughs> We've seen two big examples of that, in addition to some of the deeper dives into sort of experiments and, 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 and thinking about, uh, about the quality of data. Um, so, uh, Daniel, uh, over to you for some reflections on all this. Um, as I said, we're running a little late, so, you know, don't feel the need to go on at great length, but we're, we're keen to hear from you and your reflections on the report and maybe on some of the themes that were picked up today from the report. So, thanks. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mahler. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Talop. And thank you for the organizers. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, DEC is uh, my second professional home. I'll, I'll always think fondly looking back at my seven years of that I spent in the DEC RG hallways. In the chief economist offices, we see uh, ourselves as bridges between academic 
uh, research done in Decker G universities around the world, and our operational colleagues that don't have time to really read through uh, uh, the literature or stay in touch of the academic literature to make sense of it. And so it's, uh, uh, I'm really delighted to be here to be invited. It also gives me some room to um, advertise our forthcoming uh, flagship regional report on, on the digital economy that's uh, titled The Upside of Digital for the Middle East and North Africa. It should be coming to uh, your inboxes, uh, hopefully in the last week of June and uh, at the latest early, early July. Um, I'd like to uh, offer three sets of comments and I'll be briefer than is my usual. So we'll probably, I'll probably have you entertain until about 1 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time. Uh, the first set of comments is on measuring uh, statistical capacity. Uh, it, I think this area, this contribution of the WDR is super important. Uh, as if Islam in our office and myself, we have a little working paper uh, trying to provoke further research on uh, how various dimensions of statistical capacity at the country level translate into faster uh, economic growth. Our estimates are uh, admittedly very rough and very preliminary, but I do believe that we, it's, a, it's a fertile area for research with important uh, operational implications. Uh, I also would like to uh, acknowledge the great progress that has been made by this WDR21 team in moving forward the statistical capacity index, which had been in place as Malar uh, stated since 2004, uh, uh, to add uh, 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 global coverage of the indicator and new dimensions of the indicator. Uh, I think they're both uh, useful. The SCI had a problem of coverage, it only covered developing countries, so we never really knew what were the frontier, uh, which we suspected was uh, captured by the high income economies, uh, wasn't covered. So covering the whole globe is an immensely useful uh, exercise. I think also adding uh, strength to the dimensions of access and transparency, it's tremendously useful, and there couldn't be a more important, a, a better region to discuss that particular dimension than the Middle East and North Africa, which is widely known uh, even before I started working uh, again in MENA three and a half years ago, uh, that it's known as a, a data desert. Uh, the data desert uh, uh, situation comes from two dimensions. There are some countries where uh, the uh, institutional capacity to produce high quality, using the, the terminology of the WDR, and reliable indicators as well as the frequency which, which they get published. And in MENA, this has been hampered by wars. So if you look at both the SCI and the SPI, uh, the, the bottom ranked uh, countries in MENA are Syria, Yemen, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Iraq, uh, which are war-torn economies, also Libya. So wars have had a tremendously uh, destructive uh, and harmful effect on many, many dimensions, and a long-lasting one is this issue of transparency and data production. So clearly, institutional capacity matters, but access and transparency and ease of access also matters. And here I'd like to quibble a little bit methodologically just to carry the research agenda forward. Let's just say you have a country, um, uh, and Egypt comes, to, uh, comes close to this reality that it looks like world-class in terms of the set of indicators that they produce. They claim to follow all of the international standards, though I would quibble, for example, in the labor uh, market indicators, whether or not they actually follow international standards for measuring on th simple things like unemployment or female labor force participation. But let's assume that they do. So suppose you have this country, which is large, large population, large economy, lots of resources, so it can have competent uh, uh, national statistical offices, and let's just say scores perfect score in the data that it collects, in the quality that it collects, and the frequency that it collects. But let's just say that access is zero. Should that country then get, an, uh, an, the, the, uh, get the average indicator of 50 out of 100, or should it be zero? I argue that it should be the minimum of the two, and, and that you can't just add them up because it does you no good to have the government control all of these high quality data and nobody can access it on time to do research. 
So I think that the indicator, the aggregate indicator, cannot be just your run of the mill where you just add 51 dimensions, then <laughs> and that's the score of the country, right? This is is moving into the area that Martin Ravalion, when it came to measuring poverty, was the mesh up indicator problem, right? It's exactly the same the same problem. You're not adding more information in terms of the use of the data that's collected if you don't take into account that. If you have zero access, for example, then what is the usefulness of having this arsenal of, of, of data that only the, the, the front lines of, of the ministries have access to? Right? So that's, 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 that's my first uh, big ticket uh, comment that I think that we need to rethink a little bit more how we add up multiple dimensions of a very complex uh, uh, issue. And I don't think that adding up works. I think that we need to uh, move towards a, a, a minimum uh, indicator, meaning that the country would be ranked or the score would be set either by the minimum of the access, whichever one's lower, the, the, the quality indicator or the access indicator. But you, my, my point is that you cannot do better than the access indicator. So that's the first comment. Second of all, I'd like to touch on this issue of trust, which I suspect it's fundamental and it's an issue that we began to play around with in our forthcoming report titled The Upside of Digital for MENA. In, for this, I need to spend a couple of minutes, Dion, just giving some, some uh, factual background on the situation in MENA. That it's, it's more easily um, uh, thought of as a region that suffers from a digital paradox. It is a region where everybody uses social media, yet almost nobody uses digital payments. How can that be? And so uh, uh, what I mean is that by uh, 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 that everybody is uh, uh, digitally savvy and has Facebook accounts, it's conditional on GDP per capita. So if you run a regression of uh, GDP per capita, quadratic function, et cetera, and you throw in a MENA dummy, for Facebook active subscriptions, you get an excess over predicted by GDP per capita of around eight percentage points of the population. When you do the same for digital payments, you get a negative 16 percentage points. And that's the digital paradox. Excess use of social media and under uh, utilization of the primordial tool of the digital economy, which is digital payments. So what explains it? So we started doing some preliminary research with colleagues in DECRG, including Bob, David Mare, who's now in the, in the forthcoming uh, uh, WDR22 team. And we hit another puzzle for MENA. The two usual suspects that you would expect are, are positive correlates of the adoption of digital payments are banking system development, the banking, banking system asset size, as a share of GDP and the regulatory environment. And so in this emerging research with Bob, we're deploying the bank supervision and regulatory uh, 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 index to construct a proxy for restrictiveness. What banks are allowed to do or not allowed to do. And so around the world, those two variables basically tell you who it has higher uh, adoption rate of digital payments than others. The only exception is MENA where those two variables, essentially the marginal effect within the MENA uh, uh, sample is zero. So the, we have large banking systems dominated by SOE banks and under and, and huge la uh, lagging gaps in, the, in, 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 in uh, the use of digital payments as per the FINDEX data, right? And uh, within MENA, you have super restrictive systems and super lax banking systems, right? Israel being one of the most restricted banking systems in the world and has one of the most advanced digital payment systems in the world. So within MENA, those two usual suspects don't seem to have an effect in terms of bringing about the growth or adoption of digital payments. So what's behind it? We believe it might be lack of trust. And so we it, we, we're playing around with a set of circumstantial evidence, though it's far from being a proven uh, uh, hypothesis. 
which is that lack of trust in the state and related organizations, including the SOE dominated biking system, have uh, uh, for decades now implied that the citizens of MENA don't use the banking system and they're not using digital payments, even though everybody has Facebook accounts and has access to fast-speed internet of one sort or another, or at least through mobile telephony. So what's behind it if it's not these two usual suspects? We, we believe, and this is my third comment, that it has to do with this notion of trust. And so the notion of trust for MENA is, is very, very important. We are a region that's characterized by persistent and ongoing social unrest, not just war. At least since the Arab Spring, we've had, we've had persistent uh, street protests where young, highly educated, particularly women, who are more educated and better educated than men, are protesting the economic conditions and political conditions. They're also protesting lack of voice in their societies. And we believe we have a strong hunch that without dealing with this lack of trust in the state and associated institutions, the upside of digital economy will not materialize. And here I come to my final point, which is directly related to the WDR. I, I think there's still many, many issues that put this idea of the data social contract in, in center stage, but that it's not so simple when you're asking governments who don't necessarily have the trust of their citizenry behind them in the driver's seat to uh, approve legislations and regulations and participate in these new data social contracts. Let me give you the concrete example of this information. This information in the digital age is similar to data pollution. Right? And there's a psychology, uh, academic literature that shows that it's part of human nature. The more that you get bombarded with disinformation, bad, wrong facts, alternative facts, et cetera, the more likely people are in psychology experiments, in an experimental setting, to share that information with others. And the bigger the size of the, 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 the misinformation, the more likely you are to, to lower your guard and transmit that, this information for others. Paul Romer, our former chief economist, a Nobel laureate, has been arguing based on first principles that given that this information is similar, very, very similar to a negative externality, that the right policy prescription should be a tax on Google ads, Facebook ads, Twitter ads, et cetera. But now, back to reality in the developing world, particularly MENA, who's going to be in charge of imposing that uh, uh, sort of uh, the equivalent of a carbon tax on this information? It's going to be the government. Many of the governments in MENA are world-class sources of the, of the digital wars of this information, both in the GCC and in the developing countries of the region. So even for first principles of economics, it wouldn't work because they wouldn't charge themselves a tax on digital advertising. So there's no way around the analog constraint to the growth of digital uh, 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 economy while also dealing with the potential risks of data sharing in the 21st century to the 20th century problem of the state improving citizens' access and dialogue with, the, with its citizenry uh, to, to build trust. Digital can help movements towards data transparency and improvements, particularly with detected in the regulatory, e-commerce regulatory indicators, similar to those presented by Vivian, that MENA, both high-income and middle-income MENA countries, are lagging behind in the dimensions that you would expect reflect lack of trust or that keep producing lack of uh, citizens' trust in the system. Namely, they lag behind in privacy protection, consumer protection, and cyber cybersecurity. In a sense, the laws themselves are reflecting the initial uh, handicap that MENA countries face 
in terms of building trust among citizens in the state, even the 20th century state, and without it, I am afraid that we will not be able to usher into a 21st century era of any form of meaningful social, social contra, contract capable of rebuilding or building a new so society's trust in the state and, and related institutions. Thank you very much, Dion and the team for inviting me today. It's been a great pleasure re following this, this enterprise of the WDR21, and I look very much forward to continuing to contribute to research and to policy uh, discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel, for those those uh, really interesting insights and 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 for bringing it sort of very much that that kind of mena lens um, to to the problems that we've been hearing about uh, throughout the talk today. So we've reached the end of our a lot of time. I'm going to ask your indulgence to maybe uh, stick around for maybe five minutes or so because I'd like to give the team a chance to maybe respond um, to the to the to the three sort of challenges that that maybe Daniel laid out. One is sort of the notion of access and 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 and, and aggregation and and is access king um, to the issue of 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 trust. Although there, I feel like we already discussed that. You, you added a few dimensions to that, a few shades to that. And then last, this notion of how do you do a, how do you develop a sort of a social contract around data when you know some of the players uh, don't have, don't engender trust. Um, so I don't know how you'd like to organize yourselves as a team to maybe one of each of you respond to each of those themes. Um, and maybe we can go for another five minutes um, on that. Uh, uh, Bob, Vivian, Dean, maybe as, as the co-directors, do you want to um, each take a stab at one of those or or, or just coordinate? How, how do you, what do you think, Dean? Well, yeah. you know, I it's easy for me to take a crack at the aggregation uh, question or comment. Um, okay. I have a quick one on that. But why don't I just do that real quickly then? So, so Daniel, uh, super useful point. I mean, I, I interpret what you were saying is what's the right production function for getting this statistical performance indicator? And you're suggesting that it should look like a weakest link kind of model, that the system is only as good as its weakest link or taking the min value of uh, each of the sort of sub dimensions and and i think the honest answer you know that all of us have to give is we don't know what that right production function is you know and a bit of the problem is that we don't we haven't we don't have a history of having done enough of this analysis and and it's a very difficult question to try to tackle um you know so i think we offer one version of that spi but also on the web page uh for the statistical performance indicators it's clear that and the fact that you can set your own weights on that um, index there. And so certainly propose, you know, doing what you're proposing is very much feasible. And I think would be very much welcomed because I think there would be tremendous uh, appetite to see if there are variants of this SPI that can outperform it. I mean, as, as everyone knows who's listening, this, this question of what are the right weights on all of these indicators or on all of these indices are, is really untractable. Um, questions, but they just have to be sort of built up around a, a large database of empirical evidence. And I think what the SBI team has done has been this really nice of sort of making the data open, but also giving tools so that you can use that data really easily and set your own weights on it. So quick, uh, I'm, I'm taking the super easy one there. I, uh, Dion, I think you indicated that the, um, the quality that we may have sort of already handled. And then uh, uh, Bob, Vivian, Millar, do either of you want to take a crack at what I think is also an, uh, an almost an unanswerable question of how to think about um, uh, developing a social contract in, in a situation with bad actors. Vivian, do you want to just, I'll handle whatever's left. If you don't want to say anything, then I'll jump in. How about that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. It's an intractable question. Um, you know, uh, often there's this implicit assumption of the honest broker role in, in creating the social contract. But having said that, I do think the WDR emphasizes the fact that uh, the social contract is not just about the government and that both civil society and industry are, are very big and important players in this. And, and, and may potentially have a role to play so and I, and I think civil society has definitely shown its own in, in the MENA context as well in recent years so that's the only only hope I can offer you there 
Um, I do agree with your point on access, Daniel. And as you know, we have this, uh, we have a full um, chapter on this topic, but I, I would see it more as a, a complement. Um, so I would say, first of all, you need a good statistical system and then you need good access. I think chapter five, but I wouldn't like merge them into a single index. I think that that's confounding too many things. You know, we, we've shown a, a lot, I think, in chapter five about the demand side barriers for access, the fact that even when you do have access, there's a lot of underconsumption of data and so on. So there's a whole complex story around that, which we don't have time to get into now. Uh, and maybe finally, I just like to give a nod to a very interesting question that was raised on the chat about the, um, the threat of cross border trade in terms of uh, for developing countries. Um, and I wanted to mention that in addition to the trust issues around data protection, I think one of the big questions is who captures value when developing country data moves into other countries, particularly given that often the capacity to turn that data into economic value is you know, disproportionately in other countries. And I think that's behind a lot of the um, anxiety that we're seeing in developing countries trying to protect their data or to prevent it flowing across borders. I, I think the, the danger with that is that there may not be the capacity domestically to create that value. And so you're basically just you know, locking it up. Um, a better approach would be if we could find ways uh, to ensure that developing countries actually share in the value that is created through their data by other actors. Um, and that brings us into more complex debates around taxation, uh, et cetera. But that's for another day. Thank you very much. And over to you, Bob. Unless, Millar, did you have anything you wanted to add? I mean, it, Dean and Vivian have done a good job covering this. Uh, so I'll just say that it, in developing this notion of the social contract, uh, we didn't want to come across as too um, Pollyannish. Um, and so uh, we recognize that uh, if if your social contract with respect to other things is not so great in a society, it's unlikely to be that great with respect to data and the digital economy as well. And this is a huge limitation. And, and perhaps we could have acknowledged it more in the report, but it's funny, it's, it's Dan's comments and those from others during the bankwide review that led us to do things like show how the statistical performance indicators are tied to freedom of the press. Uh, so clearly, uh, Vivian alluded to this briefly, it's going to be the role of other actors that keep certain governments and government actors honest. Um, they're not going to have the incentives to do it themselves necessarily. And so um, we, we highlight the role of alternative data sources. You know, there's this website, I paid a bribe that we highlight in the report. And in addition, we talk about, um, you know, web scraping activities to highlight, uh, um, to get better in, to get um, non-governmental forms of uh, price indices that uh, have been used in the academic literature and in policy world to, to as a check on governments who might not have been fully forthcoming when it came to certain statistics. So Dan, I think you highlight a, a fundamental problem. I think we're not arguing that this social contract we can assume benevolent actions on the part of governments. And third, I think that it's going to take um, alternative actors and alternative sources of information and data and analytics that um, are our best bet to hold certain governments um, feet to the fire on, on these issues. And, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, so before closing, I just want to uh, uh, point out that Brian has been putting a couple of links in the chat for those of you who are interested in following up on, on, on the SPI uh, data. Um, and I will we'll leave the session open just a couple of minutes after we all uh, sign off, just in case you want to go to the chat and, and, and cut and paste or click on those. Um, so with apologies for running over, and that's due to my lack of uh, timekeeping, uh, but I was fascinated by all of the presentations and really didn't want to cut, cut people too short. Um, uh, but want to thank the presenters, uh, Bob, uh, Talib, um, Dean and Malar and Vivian, as well as our discussant um, Dan today. Thank you very much uh, for your interventions and reflections. And, uh, you know, as much as one sees the end of a WDR and its dissemination as an end point, as, as the discussion today uh, highlighted, it's also the starting point of a whole new set of discussions and conversations. So I look forward to, to interacting with all of you on those as we move forward on the research and, and, and data fronts uh, flowing from this WDR. So uh, again, thank you and congratulations on the report um, and have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.
Thanks, Dion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.